Okay, everybody. Uh, we are ready to roll for our second panel of the day. Um, before we get started, though, I do want to say um, this entire conference, the three panels, uh, there is 3.75 uh, hours of credit for um, CLE for these panels today. There are two forms outside the door. Uh, one is the certificate of attendance, and the other is the um, evaluation. If you could fill those out and leave those with us, we will fill in the CLE activity number as soon as we get approved for that. So um, again, those forms are right outside the door, um, and um, if you'll just leave those with us before you leave today, we'll make sure you get the credit. Okay, well, I have the pleasure of um, introducing our next panel topic, which is the Kentucky Constitution features quirks and practice pointers, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the panel moderator, uh, Treasurer Allison Ball. She's the 38th state treasurer of the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the youngest statewide female elected official in the country. A University of Kentucky College of Law graduate, Treasurer Ball practiced bankruptcy law and also spent time as an assistant Floyd County attorney prior to serving as state treasurer. Treasurer Ball is focused on being a watchdog for Kentucky taxpayer dollars spent in Frankfurt. Since taking office, she has launched a new transparency website making it easier for Kentuckians to see how the state government is spending their money. She's launched a savings and investment program for Kentuckians with disabilities called Stable Kentucky, and she's created a financial empowerment coalition and database focused on improving the financial literacy of Kentuckians. Treasurer Ball is married to Taylor County, Kentucky native, Asa James Swan. The couple has one son, Levi, whose birth in 2018 made Treasurer Ball the first Kentucky constitutional officer to give birth while in office. Please join me in welcoming Treasurer Ball. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Well, you probably didn't, hope, is this mic working? We got it, we good? It may not be, ah, much, much better. Okay, great, and I don't have to yell as much. What you didn't really hear in my bio, that one of my proudest things that I've done in my entire career was I was the Federal Society president during my third year at UK Law. Uh, the Federal Society is probably my favorite uh, thing that I was a part of in law school, and uh, it is one of my uh, proudest memberships still. And I'm very, very glad that we still have uh, this growing body of uh, attorneys that are wanting to have conventions and, uh, and just believe in the principles that I believe in. So thank you for being here, and I'm excited about this topic. This is a topic that I care very much about. As a constitutional officer, uh, it means a lot to me that we uh, are thinking about the Kentucky State Constitution. Uh, I want to give a little bit of a quick bio of each one of our panelists. So I'm going to start on my left first. Uh, we've got over here Matt Kuhn. Oh, and actually, before I go a little bit further, let me just mention, your programs say four panelists. And uh, so we're down one, and I almost said that, uh, you know, for, for the role of um, Bill Throw today, we'd have John Roach come up and just surprise him and have him come up, because I know that he's very capable of talking on this topic. But he's off the hook. It would have been fun just to have seen what he would have done, and I think it would have been great for all of us. But uh, so we have Matt Kuhn first starting off. Matt is Dep Deputy General Counsel to Governor Matt Bevin. In that capacity, he represents Governor Bevin and the executive branch agencies in trial and appellate courts. They're always in the news, as you know. Matt is a former law clerk for Judge Raymond W. Grunder of the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. Prior to his government service, Matt was a litigator at Jones Day in Washington, D.C., and also practiced at Stoll, Keenan and Ogden in Louisville, Kentucky. That's where I first met him. Uh, he is a graduate of Furman University and Columbia Law School. Matt and his wife Elizabeth, who's in the paper quite a bit as well, uh, is Governor Bevin's communications director, and uh, I, I don't think I'm spilling any beans by saying they're expecting their first baby. So I feel a kindred spirit to them right now. I asked him first if I could, if I could say that, he gave me an okay. I approve. Good. Uh, to my right uh, is somebody that's not a stranger to anybody in this room. We have Eric Lykin. Um, Eric is a graduate of Center College in 92 and a graduate of UK College of Law in 95. Um, he's known for a lot of different uh, areas. I always think of him as an election law guru, and that's true. But I recently found out that he was responsible for getting the largest judgment in Kentucky history. He got an $870 million judgment against unregulated offshore internet gambling operations. So uh, that's a pretty impressive piece of information that I did not know. 
uh, as far as the political realm, he's been very involved, and I, I knew him probably first as counsel for uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's 2014 re-election effort. He also is currently general counsel to the Republican Party of Kentucky and the Kentucky House Republican leadership, and I hope he gives us a little bit of uh, insight into uh, what's going on in that world right now. Uh, he's also advised gubernatorial campaigns in Kentucky, Ohio, and several other states, as well as been an advisor to legislative caucuses across the country, including Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Uh, he also has served as counsel to multiple campaigns, super PACs, trade associations, and nonprofits. Uh, and he also uh, advised a, uh, I believe it was a super PAC that was a $10 million super PAC in favor of uh, Ted Cruz in his presidential run. So uh, a wide variety of experiences. With, with him. Uh, on the far end, I have Joe Bilby, who is general counsel for the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, uh, also a former law school classmate of mine, and his wife is a native of Prestonsburg, where I'm from, so great people. Uh, before joining the department in 2016, Joe was in private practice with Stoll, Keenan, Ogden, and Louisville, where he worked in employment law and business litigation. He graduated from the University of Virginia, as well as the University of Kentucky College of Law, and he's a proud veteran of the United States Marine Corps, and he also has currently a solo practice, um, Bilby Law PLLC, and I, I believe you're mostly specializing in uh, First Amendment religious cases. Is that correct, Joe? Very good. Uh, excellent. So we have... Um, Fantastic panelists, fantastic subject. Uh, like I said, being a constitutional officer, this is a subject that is very near and dear to me. It's one I want us to think about a lot more than I think that we do. So I'm very glad this is part of our discussion today. Uh, Commonwealth of Kentucky was admitted to the Union as the 15th state in 1792. It has over 200 years of history, but we've had four constitutions. Uh, the first one is in 1792, the second one was in 1799, third one 1850, and the fourth one in 1891, and that's the one, of course, that is currently in force right now. I think there's something of an apocryphal story about Thomas Jefferson being somehow involved and in perhaps even the ghost writer for the first Constitution. I don't know that this is true. I've actually tried to find out if there's any factual basis to this, but I've heard this story many, many times. So uh, it, rumor has it that's a part of our history. And something that is always said whenever you talk about the Kentucky State Constitution is that we have one of the strongest separation of powers uh, in the country, if not the strongest. Um, so with that, uh, I do want to open it up to our first panelists. Um, if you would just give us some opening remarks. Sure. Well, thanks for the invitation, and it's very good to be here. I helped plan this event last year, um, and I know what a heavy lift it is uh, to do that, so thanks to the folks who planned it. Uh, but this is really um, something that distinguishes Kentucky. Uh, the fact that we can fill this chamber uh, in our first year and now in our second year is a big deal for us. Um, you know, Kentucky is a part of the rule of law conversations. We saw the leader talking about that, and, and this is a, a very important piece of that. Um, in representing the governor, our office uses uh, Kentucky's governing charter um, quite literally every day. Um, it has over 200 provisions. You would be shocked how many things it provides guidance on or just resolves questions about. Um, just recently, we were looking at what's required when, uh, when a pardon issues. Uh, well, Section 77 actually gives a specific direction about some writing that is required uh, when that issues. Um, and so we've got, uh, we deal with that every day. Um, and at the outset, I wanted to, as someone who litigates uh, the Constitution a lot, uh, I wanted to give you kind of the toolbox for a uh, state practitioner to litigate state constitutional law. Um, the first thing, obviously, is the Constitution. Um, we've got over 200 provisions. Uh, we are in the 1890-1891 version of it. Um, we've amended it since that time. So the first thing you're going to rely on is the text. You're going to rely on cases. But the third thing that I really want to point out to all of us uh, is that we have a very rich constitutional debates in Kentucky that were recorded in 1890 and 91 uh, that have been transcribed. Uh, we have several thousand pages of debates um, that went, uh, went on really across um, several months um, that if you go to the library here on the second floor, anybody can get a disc uh, of all of those debates. Um, and I think it's one of the most important things for a constitutional law practitioner in Kentucky um, because all, most of the provisions that are in the current iteration of our, Kentucky, of our Constitution in 1891 were extensively debated by people who were um, highly educated, who had thought through these things. Um, a lot of the issues that we are seeing currently in 2018 were actually debated extensively in 1890 and 91. Uh, an example that I'll give uh, of this and can weigh in a little bit more later, um, 
we're dealing, our Supreme Court has the hands-on original case right now, which uh, poses a, a unique question uh, about uh, freedom of religion, freedom of expression. Um, issues that are like the hands-on original case, for those who don't know, um, which is the uh, t-shirt printer in Lexington who refused to print uh, on the basis of his religious beliefs uh, a t-shirt celebrating a gay pride festival uh, in Lexington. Um, and that has made it all the way up to our Supreme Court. Um, we actually have in our constitutional debates, debates about limiting freedom of conscience uh, and what are uh, the consequences of that for the Commonwealth. Um, and I think that's a very uh, rich source for Kentucky constitutional law. Um, now I've been at a lot of these FedSoc events and there's a, a rich debate at Federalist Society events about whether, uh, what does originalism mean? Um, when I'm talking about originalism there, I was talking about original intent. Uh, what did our framers intend with our constitution? Um, there's a rich debate about original public meeting versus original intent. But our Supreme Court has told us that original intent matters a whole heck of a lot in what we do uh, as practitioners under the Kentucky Constitution. Um, so I'd encourage all of you that are litigating constitutional cases to go look at the debates. Um, they are now text searchable. Um, you know, uh, that, that's a new thing, so you can click through them really easily. Um, in closing, uh, before I move on, I want to give you the two points that I'd really like to make to you today in thinking about the Constitution of Kentucky. Um, is that we have some really important protections of rights and liberties in our Constitution that are greatly underutilized. Um, I think in our current climate, the federal Constitution and the United States Supreme Court uh, takes up most of the oxygen in all debates and litigations, uh, litigation uh, about um, protections of rights and liberty. Um, I think that is uh, just a function of the world we live in, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, hopefully we can talk, the panel can talk today about some of the um, unbelievable protections of liberty that our founders put in 130 years ago. Um, and, and it would be great with me, me speaking, um, if we saw an emergence of state constitutional law, of us taking our state constitution a, a whole lot more seriously. Uh, and that leads into the second point that I'd like to leave, leave with you today, um, is that protecting our state constitution and enforcing it based on its text and based on its history, um, I think that's an important part of our sovereignty um, as the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Um, I don't think we should exceed that sovereignty or give that sovereignty to the federal government by saying we're going to interpret our constitution identically to how we interpret the federal constitution. Now that can be proper when we've got identical provisions, um, but, it's, but in my view it's improper when we've got very different provisions with very different histories. Um, so I hopefully will convince you of, of the idea that um, protecting our state constitution and enforcing it um, is an important part of sovereignty. Thank you, Eric, if you'd take the second spot. Sure, thank you. Um, well, as, as somebody who's spent a lot of time in this chamber, I can't tell you how nice it is to see this many conservatives in these seats. Um, hopefully after next Tuesday, we can, we can make some of that permanent. But, um, so I, like a lot of you, probably um, have not spent a lot of time, at least until this last year, thinking about the Kentucky Constitution. Um, but I got a, 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 a ringside seat to some, some of the, the best brawls. Um, I was asked, uh, I think I got the call on December 23rd um, from uh, Speaker Pro Tem Osborne to come up and represent leadership uh, during the, the legislative session. And uh, you know, we, were, we were about a week away at that point, and I said, you know, well, Speaker, I, I, I appreciate that, but just so you know, I, I have a job, and I, you know, I have a law practice, and I, you know, I'm kind of busy with that. And he said, well, that's, that's really interesting. We'll talk about that next Tuesday when you're here in the chamber. So sitting back in that uh, little black chair under the video screen, and uh, we had a, if you were following the session, it all had a little bit of, of excitement that first day or two. Uh, the parliamentarian happened to be out sick that day. So... Um, the Speaker of the House, the current Speaker of the House at the time, resigned on the floor, submitted his resignation, subject uh, to being accepted by the chamber. So everybody turns and looks at me, and they hand me a Bible-sized tome. It's called the Mason's Manual of, of Legislative Procedure. I had never seen or heard of this book. It's uh, kind of, kind of <laughs> like the Robert's Rules of Order, and you know how many of us really know Robert's Rules, but I had never heard of Mason's Manual. 
they hand me the book and say, okay, Eric, what do we do? And by the way, the cameras are rolling. So welcome to the Kentucky Constitution. Um, by the way, we adjourned very, very rapidly. And <laughs> <laughs> went into the speaker's office and discussed it. Um, so you know, after that, we have you know, a lot of different uh, constitutional issues from that. For, for one, um, the speaker had tried to resign when, we, when the legislature was in session. So since we don't have a continuous legislature, there was a great question of whether that re uh, resignation could have been effective. So that's why we're on day one dealing with that issue, uh, kind of like a, as a surprise. So, um, and then of course, uh, we had some other constitutional issues. Uh, Senate Bill 151, I think made the papers. Uh, we've been litigating that one um, very intently. So um, like Matt said, you know, the, the Kentucky Constitution um, is, you know, it, it's different from the federal constitution. It gives us a lot of our different rights and it, it's much more involved and much bigger than the federal constitution, which of course, you know, that's, that's restraining government. Um, but the Kentucky constitution gives government a lot more power um, and, and gets into a lot of details like that. So, um, uh, like, a, um, when, when, topic I want to talk about, Allison was talking about elections. One thing you're going to be seeing a lot of with state constitutions is dealing with elections, particularly legislative redistricting. Because we've been successful at the federal level of uh, appointing judges who uh, interpret the Constitution as it's written and, and not with their own prejudices, now the, the other side is starting to turn to state uh, courts and their Supreme Courts. You saw this in Pennsylvania um, for the first time, uh, partisan redistricting. It's fine under the federal constitution, but under the Pennsylvania state constitution, they ruled that that's unconstitutional. That's probably going to determine Congress. So as we move on with our panel and talk about the state constitution, think about those kinds of issues and uh, so. I want to spend some time today <clears throat> talking about one new opinion in particular from the Kentucky Supreme Court that came out just over a month ago. And I'm talking about uh, a case called Cabinet for Health and Family Services v. Sexton. Uh, counsel for the cabinet in that case was Kathy York, who I know was here earlier today. Kathy, are you still here? There she is. Well, congratulations on a great win. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about you and your work today. Uh, the Sexton case holds for the very first time that the jurisdiction of Kentucky's Court of Justice is restricted to cases where the plaintiff can meet three essential standing principles. The need for a judicially cognizable injury, the need for a causation link between that injury and some action of the defendant, and the ability of the court to redress that injury in particular. And these three principles are familiar to many of us in this room from the U.S. Supreme Court's opinion in Lujan v. Defenders of Wildlife in 1992 and other more recent federal court cases. But the Sexton case decided just last month is the first time that those three requirements have been acknowledged and recognized as constitutional standing requirements in Kentucky's state courts. Sexton's important because it took up and transformed what had been a judicially created standing policy, first announced by the old Court of Appeals in 1957 which basically says that a plaintiff lacks standing where the injury he suffered was no greater than that of any other citizen. So until Sexton, Kentucky's courts did have a prohibition against generalized grievances, at least to some extent, but that prohibition was not grounded in the text of the Kentucky Constitution. What's new about Sexton is that the Supreme Court has taken what was that judicially created standing policy and now transformed it into a constitutional requirement for a showing of injury, causation, and redressability. And I think that because of that, the Sexton case is setting up a collision course between very long-standing lines of Kentucky cases, two lines in particular, that have been elaborated separately over the past century. As I'll try to explain today, these two lines of cases point in contradictory directions on the question of whether a Kentucky taxpayer can have standing to sue an agency of the Commonwealth. 
Before I get into that, though, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the particulars of the Sexton case. Now, most of what I'm talking about today has to do with taxpayer plaintiff cases, but the Sexton case was not a taxpayer plaintiff case. Uh, Ms. Letty Sexton was a patient who was admitted to the Appalachian Regional Hospital's facility in Harlan with complaints of chest pains. Her initial 23-hour observation stay was pre-approved by a managed care organization that had contracted with the cabinet to provide reimbursement services, reimbursement for certain services provided to Medicaid beneficiaries like Ms. Sexton. But her hospitalization went beyond those 23 hours and eventually totaled 38 hours of care. So when the hospital requested payment for those additional 15 hours, the MCO denied reimbursement. Next, the hospital, ostensibly acting on behalf of Ms. Sexton, requested an administrative hearing to challenge the MCO's denial of payment. Apparently, the statutes and regulations that were in place at that time made it difficult, if not impossible, for the hospital to bring that challenge in its own name. So Letty Sexton was the nominal claimant and later the nominal plaintiff in the circuit court action, even though she really had no personal stake in the reimbursement dispute between the hospital and the MCO. At the administrative hearing level, the claim was rejected because Letty herself had no standing. So the next step was to file a 13B petition for judicial review in the Harlan Circuit Court. The circuit judge denied the motion to dismiss that had been filed by the cabinet and the MCO on several different grounds. One of the Rule 12 motions that the circuit court rejected was the cabinet's claim of sovereign immunity. And as many of you know, sovereign immunity is one of the very few issues in Kentucky's court system that can warrant an interlocutory appeal. So the case, actually there were several cases filed at the same time, all went up to the Court of Appeals on that issue. The Court of Appeals ruled that the cabinet's sovereign immunity argument failed because the General Assembly had already waived immunity in cases like this one. And the court then went on to make some additional rulings on questions of venue and other matters that are not pertinent to my discussion today. Next, the Supreme Court took the case on discretionary review. In the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Minton wrote for a six justice majority that the court could not reach the immunity issue without first satisfying itself that the plaintiff had the requisite standing to sue. And he said that courts have a continuing duty to do this, either by the motion of a party or on the court's own motion, because issues of constitutional standing are not subject to waiver. Ultimately, the Supreme Court never did reach the merits of the immunity issue because it determined that Letty Sexton, the nominal plaintiff who was really a stand-in for the hospital's claims against that MCO, had no personal stake in the controversy. She had no judicially cognizable entry because she did not stand to gain financially from a ruling in the hospital's favor. Whatever financial benefit would come from the litigation would go to the hospital, not to her. As such, Ms. Sexton had no more of a stake in the controversy than does any member of the public who generally thinks that an MCO ought to pay the bills that a hospital <coughs> submits for Medicaid services. Because she had no standing to sue, her case had to be dismissed. So in the Sexton opinion, the court formally adopts the U.S. Supreme Court's standing case from the Lujan case back in 1992. And that again is the constitutional requirement that a plaintiff must be able to show, first, that he or she sustained a judicially cognizable injury, second, that the injury was caused by something that the defendant did, and third, that the injury is one that the court has some ability to redress. And if you think back to that 1992 decision, it was grounded in a reading of the constitutional text of Article III, which says that federal courts shall have jurisdiction only over cases and controversies. The cases and controversies language is the textual foundation for Article III standing requirements. And those standing requirements serve as an important restriction that prevents federal district courts from hearing disputes brought by plaintiffs who lack a personal stake in the outcome. In other words, in federal court, a plaintiff lacks standing if he or she is challenging a law or other government action that affects the plaintiff no more than it affects everybody else. What the plaintiff has in that case is nothing more than a generalized grievance which the standing rules are supposed to keep out of federal courts. And there are at least two policy rationales for why we should want to keep taxpayer plaintiff cases out of federal courts. 
For one, you want litigants who actually have skin in the game on the assumption that litigants who will benefit or be burdened by the outcome tend to contest the issues more vigorously than would an ordinary citizen. And then more broadly, you want to prevent courts from inserting themselves into public policy disputes that really ought to be decided by political branches of government, not by judges. Now, the Kentucky Supreme Court's decision to adopt the Lujan test was not an automatic choice. And I say that for three reasons. First, the courts of limited jurisdictions, like you see in the federal district courts, are not courts of general jurisdiction. By contrast, circuit courts are vested to hear all cases and controversies not vested in some other court. As such, you might expect that the circuit courts in the state court would use looser standing rules than you see in the federal courts. And in fact, state courts in many other states do use looser standing rules. For instance, state courts in other states only require a plaintiff to show that he or she has some substantial interest in the subject matter of the litigation. And some states go further by saying that every citizen of the state has a right to insist on the proper application of the laws of the state such that every citizen has the standing to sue when he or she believes that the laws are not being properly applied. The second reason I think why the Kentucky Supreme Court's adoption of the Lujan test was something more significant than a no-brainer is that Kentucky does have a long line of cases, some of them more than a century old, that say that a taxpayer of a city or a county or of the Commonwealth at large can have standing to sue the government under some circumstances. I'll touch on that in a minute. The third reason why it was not obvious that the Kentucky Supreme Court would adopt the Lujan test is that the Kentucky Constitution doesn't say anything about courts having power to decide only cases or controversies. The phrase cases or controversies does not appear anywhere in our state constitution. What the Constitution does have is Section 112, which defines the jurisdiction of the circuit courts. Section 112 sub 5 states, circuit courts shall have jurisdiction over all justiciable causes not vested in some other court. The key word there is justiciable. Chief Justice Minton's opinion makes the point that a case simply cannot be justiciable unless the plaintiff has an injury that was caused by something the defendant did and that is of the sort that a court is capable of redressing. Chief Justice Minton pointed out that the word justiciable did not appear in the Kentucky Constitution when it was first adopted in 1891. That word was first inserted into Section 112 as a part of the 1974 constitutional amendments that revamped our entire court of justice. And that historical event, that 1974 event, could be the key, I think, for anticipating how the court might resolve the collision that I think is coming. And here's where that collision comes in. Kentucky does have this long-standing line of cases that hold that in just the right circumstances, a citizen can have standing to sue the government and that the financial injury to his or her pocketbook as a taxpayer can form the basis for that citizen's standing to sue. Most of those cases arose with factual circumstances where the plaintiff was either challenging the collection of public funds through a system of taxation or challenging the way that those funds were spent by state agencies. Typically those cases, especially the very old ones, were brought in the form of a mandamus action where you had a citizen asking a judge to order an executive branch official to do something that the statute or the Constitution required him to do. And those cases do date back to the first decades of the 20th century, but you do see them recur all the way through the end of the 20th century. I apologize. The appellate courts have not broken much new ground in this area over the last 20 years, but occasionally, even today, you will still see those old cases touched on in passing. Now, when you think about that old line of taxpayer cases and what they mean, it's very difficult for me to reconcile them with this other 60-year-old idea, which is now enshrined as a constitutional principle thanks to the Sexton decision, that a member of the public generally cannot come into court where his or her injury is nothing more than a harm or a grievance that is shared with the public in general. Now, the court in deciding Sexton did not have to confront this tension because Letty Sexton's complaint did not predicate her standing on some financial injury that she suffered by virtue of her status as a taxpayer. 
You'll remember that Ms. Sexton's claimed injury was derived from her status as a patient who received care from the hospital that was in reality the real party in interest. So the tension between these two lines of cases will have to be resolved in some future case. And my best guess for how the court can resolve it goes back to that specific historic event noted in the Sexton opinion, the insertion in 1974 of the word justiciable into the constitutional provision that defines the parameters of circuit court jurisdiction. That event could, sound, could provide a sound rationale for holding that this older, older line of cases is no longer good law. And if that's where the court goes, that outcome, in tandem with the one that Kathy York already achieved with the Sexton decision, would mark a significant and lasting improvement to our Commonwealth's system of justice. So with that, I'll stop and uh, pass it back to you. Thank you. I'm going to open this up in just a little bit for questions, but I have some questions that I want to ask to get started. And I just want to say to all the panelists, uh, I know all of you have official roles that potentially could make it uh, a conflict for you to answer uh, because of your official role or, or pending litigation. So if there's something that I ask you and you feel like uh, you, you're not comfortable answering, that's fine. If you just say, I'll, I'll pass on this one, um, I, I want you to make sure that you feel comfortable in doing that. It's perfectly fine to do so. Uh, first question, I think I'm going to open this up to anyone. Uh, in an interview with Egyptian TV in 2012, when discussing modern post-revolutionary constitutional models, Justice Ginsburg infamously said, I would not look to the U.S. Constitution if I were drafting a constitution in the year 2012. I might look at the Constitution of South Africa. Uh, and just to let everyone in the audience know, the Constitution of South Africa contains 244 sections and eight schedules, including schedules, um, the, the versions you can download them, uh, from the South African Department of Justice is 180 pages long. So this is a very, very large document. By comparison, the Kentucky Constitution is 263 sections, uh, and it's available on LRC, and it's about 40 pages of, of small type lettering. Uh, so there's a big contrast between the two. So for um, open this up to the whole panel, Matt, let's start off with you. Do you find in the context of state governments that the more lengthy, in-depth model of the Kentucky State Constitution is a strength or a weakness compared to the U.S. Constitution? I think it's both a strength and a weakness for us. Um, <laughs> You're a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a couple of data points that I that I think about in this. Um, I, something that um, that uh, you know a liberal lion of the left, Justice Brennan, and a, and a liberal lion or conservative lion of the right, Justice Scalia, agreed on was the importance that state constitutions play in federalism. Right? Federalism is the idea that uh, part of it, at least, is that. Um, the states are the laboratories for experimentation, right? Um, Judge Sutton on the Sixth Circuit has written a great book, I think we've got a copy of it up here, 51 Imperfect Solutions, that really talks about this idea um, that we want states to try things in their constitutions. We want them to test the limits. We want them to see if it works for the four and a half or so million people in Kentucky to see if it could work uh, on a national scale. Um, so I think it's actually good that we've got a lot of specific direction in our Constitution. Uh, we can change it a lot easier than the, the federal Constitution can be changed. We can try things. I think this is just an important part uh, of our state sovereignty. We're going to have something, uh, depending on a court rule, it's going to be on the ballot anyway, but depending on a court ruling, we're going to have a, a constitutional issue that, that uh, Eric worked with the legislature on that's going to be in, in front of the voters in, uh, in a week or so, Marcy's Law, uh, depending on a court challenge. Um, so I think it's good for us to have uh, 263 provisions, I think you said. I think that's good, largely good for the Commonwealth. Eric, would you like to weigh in on that? Well, I think, yeah, you have to, have to obviously look at what the, you know, the two documents are, are, are set up to do. Is, you know, the sovereignty comes from the state level, so there are a lot more topics that the state, you know, local government, um, you know, all, all those kind of topics that the state constitution has to cover. Whereas the, the federal constitution is a restraining document to giving the federal government very limited and, and enumerated power. So it, it makes a lot of sense that state constitutions would be larger and, and cover a lot more topics and, and, and rights. Yeah, I don't have much to add other than um, I read somewhere not long ago that if you look back at those constitutional debates in the 1890s, <clears throat> One of the major topics of discussion was how to curb the power of the legislative branch in particular. And I think that part of the reform impulse that led to the calling of that constitution was a view among many in the public that the legislature had been held captive or captured by railroad and other big corporate interests. 
And so they wrote a document that was meant to tie the hands of the legislature in very specific ways to prevent the recurrence of uh, perceived abuses in the legislative branch. And as a result, Kentucky has a constitution that in its function has been always dominated by the executive branch, even though the lawmaking power clearly resides in the legislative branch. Uh, we've always had a system of what we call strong governors in this state. So I think that it's important to think about the 1891 Constitution in the context of the time when it was created. Uh, and then you look at the federal Constitution, there were very different circumstances, very different challenges, uh, and very different political trade-offs that had to be made to generate that document. So I, for one, think that a very detailed state constitution is a good thing. Uh, it is easier to change than the federal constitution. I think we have a track record of amending our state constitution, what, two or three times a decade over the course of my lifetime, and I think that's a perfectly appropriate uh, way to do that. Thank you, Joe. I think I'm going to start off with you on this one. Uh, turning again briefly to Justice Ginsburg's statement, um, many people are attracted to the South African model due to the fact that it's a grant of positive rights to the people. For example, Section 12.2a provides that the right to make decisions concerning reproduction are spelled out. Section 15 sets out a specific provision allowing for religious observances at state functions, so long as they meet a general criteria for voluntary attendance and being conducted on an equitable basis. So you've got very, very specific uh, positive rights laid out. Um, the Federalists, uh, and it's always good to quote the Federalists when you're at a Federalist Society event, Federalist 84, uh, Alexander Hamilton famously argued that the Bill of Rights in the sense and to the extent to which they are contended for are not only unnecessary in the proposed constitution, but would even be dangerous. For why declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do? Why, for instance, should it be said that the liberty of the press shall not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be imposed? I will not contend that such a provision would confer a regulating power, but it is evident that it would furnish to men disposed to usurp a plausible pretense for claiming that power. They might urge with a semblance of reason that the Constitution ought not to be charged with the absurdity of providing against the abuse of an authority which was not given. So given the expansion of governmental power through judicial decisions and general governmental overreach, is there more of a place for state constitutions to provide positive rights? In other words, uh, would Hamilton say the same thing today? Um, I, I have no idea what Hamilton would say about our <laughs> state constitution. Um, but I think it is a good thing that our state constitution does have positive rights enumerated um, and liberty guarantees that are more expansive than the ones in the federal constitution. Uh, I know in that hands-on originals case that Matt touched on earlier, uh, the governor wrote a really fantastic amicus brief that, that traced out a lot of the, the rights interest that the 1891 constitution was trying to protect. And it goes well beyond what we understand are the rights guaranteed by our federal religion clauses. Uh, there's also, I, what immediately comes to mind is section 183 of the state constitution, which uh, guarantees a, an efficient system of common schools, which was the, the predicate for the decision by the Kentucky Supreme Court in the late 80s, Rose versus <coughs> Council for Better Education, that the legislature had failed in its duty to provide an efficient system of public schools. I think that's a wonderful thing and a healthy thing. Uh, that our state constitution requires and limits what our legislature and executive branches can do to a much greater extent than would be possible under the federal constitutional regime. Uh, since we've just mentioned hands-on, uh, Matt, would you like to comment on that at all? Sure, I think that fits in pretty naturally. Um, I talked in my introduction about sort of protections of liberty. Um, that exist in our Constitution. Um, and uh, the hands-on case really brought that issue to the forefront. Um, I, I want to read, it's just one sentence, uh, Section 5 of our Kentucky Constitution. Um, and I, while I'm reading this, I want you to think in your head and compare it to the First Amendment and ask yourself which of the two you think is more protective of religious liberties. So Section 5 of our Constitution says, and I'm quoting, quoting, no human authority shall in any case whatever control or interfere with the rights of conscience. So we've got that, that and compared to the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So this hands-on case poses a really important question, uh, it could, depending on how the Supreme Court rules, under our state constitution, which is does Section 5 of our constitution provide more liberty protection than does the First Amendment? 
Um, I can tell you right now that uh, uh, the, the current law in Kentucky uh, on that issue is the Gingrich case from 2012. Gingrich dealt with Amish buggies and whether it violated Section 5 to require Amish buggies to put the little triangular emblem on the back of it when they're riding, uh, riding on the road. Uh, and the Amish um, testified, and again, it was, it was undisputed in the Gingrich case that putting those little triangles on their buggies was a violation of their sincerely held religious beliefs. No one disputed that. So it got to our Supreme Court in 2012 and they split um, four to three on the issue. Um, and the majority opinion said, wow, the, um, the, the First Amendment gives a really expansive protection of religious freedom. Um, and they said it's quote unquote, linguistically impossible to be any broader. So that we had four justices say that, um, but then we had three justices, Justice Venters was one of them, um, and he really looked at, and this is the point that I was making earlier, he said that cases interpreting the federal constitution do not control the meaning of the Kentucky constitution, nor, they, nor do they define the protections of liberty contained therein. Justice Venters was very much concerned with sovereignty, that we had used different words or expansive words. It's not protecting uh, free exercise of religion, it's protecting the rights of conscience. Um, so we've got arguably a much broader protection um, Justices Scott and Hughes dissented, and they made that very point. Um, they said, presumably the framers of Kentucky's constitution used more inclusive language, protection of rights of conscience, with the intent it would offer greater protection than the federal constitution. So that's 2012. Um, you know, less than a year later, we had our state RIFRA statute that was passed here in Kentucky um, as a direct reaction to the Gingrich decision. Um, and it was passed over the governor's veto um, and was very much tied to this. And we've never had um, since, I guess, 2013, uh, that state RIFRA statute has never been interpreted. Um, Hands-on originals gives us a case or gives the Supreme Court a chance to interpret that. Um, but for the governor's amicus brief that we filed in the case, one of the things that developed through this was we looked at a lot of the debates between the founders um, about why do we have these expansive protections of rights of conscience in our uh, constitution. Um, and it actually d dates to our first constitution from the 1790s and the language of section five has stayed in our constitution pretty much without change. But interestingly, one of the things we put in our briefs was that in 1890, there was a serious effort made to water down the protection in Kentucky of rights of conscience. Um, several of our framers considered adding the following language to qualify the rights of conscience. They said that the legislature can limit rights of conscience to justify practices or to ban or regulate practices, quote, inconsistent with the good order, peace, or safety of the state. So what our framers debated was whether or not you can limit rights of conscience based on you know, what the legislature thinks should be orthodox for the rest of us. Uh, that's a debate that we're having uh, in 2018. It's, it's fascinating to go back and read. Um, they're talking in different times using in different language, but they're grappling with the same issues that we're grappling with here. Um, one of the examples that um, one of the founders or framers gave about the danger of this, um, I mean, it, his language, of course, is very different from what we're dealing with here, but he said on the floor in debating why this limitation should not be put into our charter, he said, quote, I can so construct a legislature that they will determine that the old fashioned Methodist meetings in the wood where, woods where they shout and scream is contrary to the good and order of society. This is 1890, they're having the same types of debates that we're having about tolerance, about letting people exercise their freedom of conscience. Um, so from our perspective with this amicus brief, we view the, the hands-on case poses the same First Amendment case that existed in the Masterpiece Cake Shop decision from last term. But from the governor's perspective, we really wanted to show the court that there is a rich history of protection of rights of conscience in our Constitution. It's written there. The, the reasons for it are very, very clear from the debates. And we really want the Supreme Court um, to take a serious look at that in resolving this case. Thank you, Eric. I have a question that I think is best specifically put addressed to you. Uh, we've mentioned a little bit, it's come up a few times, that the amendment process is easier in the state of Kentucky than it is, or the Commonwealth of Kentucky, uh, than it is at the federal level, and, and that's one of the advantages of our process. Could you talk a little bit, of, because I know we have Marcy's Law 
uh, on the ballot right now, or at least potentially on the ballot right now. Uh, could you comment a little bit on Kentucky's amendment system? And if you want to address it specifically to Marcy's law, uh, I think that would be beneficial. Uh, sure. And, and I think one of the, the, the differences in Kentucky's amendment system and, and others, um, it, not just in, in amending the Constitution, but uh, we don't allow our Constitution to be amended by referendum. So it has to uh, originate in the legislature. And I think that's a, that's a very important feature. Um, you know, whether it's a strength, whether it's a weakness can be, can be debated. But you're seeing in other states um, a lot of a really poorly thought out referenda. I mean, California, what it's done to itself is, is legend. Don't need to get any farther than that. In Ohio, there's a, a perhaps well-intentioned um, uh, uh, criminal justice reform uh, referenda that's basically going to decriminalize most drug crimes other than just the, the, the most harsh uh, you know, drug dealing uh, repeat offenders. So we in Kentucky, we, it, it originates with the legislature, so you have that buffer. It's well thought out. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, that's a little propaganda on, on behalf of the House there, but uh, we hope that it's better thought out because it goes through the filter of the legislature. Um, and then um, the, the, the problem with it is um, the non-specificity. So you're, you're trying to do uh, you know, complex constitutional amendments like a Marcy's Law, but fit it on the ballot in very, very small language. And that's generally almost always going to get litigation. Um, and it's, it can be confusing. What has the legislature approved? What are the voters actually voting on? And then what's going to be the, the text of that constitutional amendment? I don't know how you solve that. Joe, you may have some ideas on that, Matt. But um, that's, that's one of the problems with it. Uh, but at least uh, we don't. Uh, allow the referendum, which uh, in other states I think you can see is just a complete mess. I have a question for you, Eric, and I hate to put you on the spot, but do you know offhand if there's a mechanism where the people of Kentucky could call for a new constitutional convention? Because I know, we, you know we did it three times in the course of the first century of the Commonwealth, 1792 through 1891. Haven't done it since. Is it even possible to do that? Um, well, I'm certain it's possible, but uh, having been put on the spot, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Section 258, of the con brought my Constitution oh. up here. Uh, <laughs> Section 258 of the Constitution actually does allow it when a majority of all members elected to each House of the General Assembly shall concur um, in enacting a law to that effect. Basically, it's a long provision, but yes, it is specifically spelled out in our 263 sections. Can you imagine what that would be like if, if we had a constitutional convention, a free-for-all where the, the text that we've received down through these first four iterations now has to be done all over again. And it's been 130 years since we've done it, yeah. I can only imagine the acrimony that would come from that. I, I think I can imagine it. <laughs> it sounds like Facebook to me. Huh? Uh, I'd like to open this up now, if I could, from the floor. I think we have a mic. Uh, is that the one that we're using? Is, is anyone, no, is that a live mic? We have a live mic? Okay, great. Uh, we have a live mic over here. Jeff is gonna be uh, walking the live mic around. Uh, so we could have a question from the floor. We're ready for that. Just addressing that last uh, point, maybe it's a part of getting old and younger people don't remember, but we had in the 60s uh, a uh, extra constitutional, constitutional convention, the, uh, some type of uh, a group of wise people who created a whole new constitution, which was then submitted to the people as a single constitutional amendment, which was then voted down resounding. Uh, but there are ways to do exactly uh, the same thing, and just as with the federal constitution, there are people who think it's a good idea uh, and it's a bad idea. I mean, it, when, you, when you say, imagine what a free-for-all it might be, well, in Philadelphia, uh, we had quite a free-for-all. It turned out uh, for the better, at least according to some people, uh, including me. But I wouldn't dismiss the idea. Uh, it gets, does better for current lawyers if you can look at all 258 uh, articles. But for the future, who knows? But it can be done. It was tried in the past and voted down, but it could be tried again in the future, I think. Judge, do you recall what the primary argument was for those who said, 
we really need to vote this one down. Jeff, there's a question over here. All right, this can be a question for anyone. Um, my question is coming at a bit of a different direction. How exactly should courts engage our document? Uh, obviously, the standard of review and the level of scrutiny is pretty critical to success in giving effect to any of these provisions. Uh, and one thing that particularly comes to mind is Section 26 that actually call, says that all laws contrary to the Bill of Rights or contrary to the Constitution shall be void. So just how does that impact a court reviewing a lot of these, I guess, more interesting provisions beyond the federal model, particularly in light of Kentucky courts seeming to follow similar tiers of scrutiny that federal courts invoke as well? I can, I can answer that. We've had... Um, two arguments uh, in the Supreme Court um, in the last couple of months about the tiers of scrutiny. Um, and that's an instance where um, Kentucky has very, we have equal protection guarantees, but they're differently worded than those in the federal charter. Um, but the Supreme Court, going back, I guess, to the late 80s, early 90s, has always said that we track the three levels, uh, three tiers of scrutiny, except when we don't. Um, there's one narrow um, allowance for that that was came up in both of our arguments. Um, so uh, that's an instance that um, I think it is incumbent upon the court um, to, I, th I think there's, there's always a temptation because the federal courts have already done the work on tiers of scrutiny, right? Um, I think there's a temptation to um, just copy what they've done um, and continue applying it. Maybe there's good reason to do that. Um, but what I'd like to posit for you is that we've got a different charter for a reason. Um, we didn't enact the 14th Amendment here. We en enacted Section 2, for example. Um, you know, one of the most interesting provisions that we've got is, is Section 2. So uh, we mentioned Section 26 that says everything in violation of the Constitution is void. Section 2 um, prohibits absolute and arbitrary power. What on earth does that mean, right? So if a, can a court sitting uh, in judgment of a statute say, well, this is an absolute and arbitrary exercise of power, and therefore I'm going to invalidate it under the Constitution? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, in 1985, the big case, the milk marketing case, the, the Supreme Court did that. And um, in December of last year, the Franklin Circuit Court invalidated uh, tort reform legislation on the basis that it was arbitrary and absolute. So, you know, we've got great constitutional law questions that we, we need to be litigating and looking at the history of Section 2. Joe mentioned earlier um, that we had problems with railroads coming in in the, the mid-1800s um, and basically getting special bills that said, I'm going to exempt Railroad X um, from taxes, uh, and only Railroad X gets that exemption. Well, our, our framers responded to that with Sections 59 and 60, which prohibit local and special acts. Um, so you can't give someone a special benefit that you don't give to people statewide. Um, I think these are really important provisions. Other states have special uh, legislation prohibitions, but these are really important uh, provisions that I think reflect our history. Um, and I think it's, um, it's not unfortunate, but it's, uh, I wish that our court was not so willing 
to just do whatever the federal courts have done on these things and take a fresh look at it um, because our text and our history and just who we are as a commonwealth, I think, uh, deserves it. That raises a, a really good point. Uh, one of my questions I'd written down that I hadn't asked you was, were, were there any uh, specific provisions that are underutilized? And so you've actually just mentioned some. Uh, would anyone else like to weigh in on that? Are you aware of any provisions that you feel like are being underutilized right now? I, I can think of one offhand. Um, there was a case in 1992, Commonwealth v. Wasson, uh, which held that Kentucky's statute prohibiting same-sex sodomy acts uh, was a violation of Kentucky's right to privacy and also a violation of Kentucky's Equal Protection Clause. And um, that opinion is brilliantly written. It's written by uh, Justice Charles Leibson, who was from Louisville. Uh, very learned, scholarly opinion. It looks at a lot of the debates uh, that Matt's already been talking about from the 1890s. I'd recommend it to anyone. It's, it's well worth a read, and it anticipated by more than 10 years uh, the conclusion that the Supreme Court of the United States came around to in 2003 with Lawrence v. Texas in holding that such a state law is unconstitutional. Uh, brilliantly written, and I think that that principle, which is that Kentuckians have a right to privacy and equal protection guarantees far greater than those in the federal constitution, could provide very fertile ground for rights litigation in the future. Um, I, it's, it's been elaborated on in some cases, but not as many as you might expect over the course of 26 years. I wonder, uh, in some future case, if there was ever a state constitutional challenge um, to an effort to restrict a woman's right to access abortion services, whether that Wasson case would have something to say about it. Uh, I think it'd be a fascinating uh, provision of constitutional law that, that really needs a lot more consideration than it's gotten. Thank you, Eric. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Great. I think I want to answer or open it up to the floor again. We've got the mic somewhere. Here you go. I can keep going if we don't have anyone else asking any questions. This is a great opportunity. I'm, I'm curious because we have three representatives of different constitutionally elected offices here. Um, if you all could speak to the pros and cons of, of that system and how we have um, five or six different officers who are elected and those offices are constitutional within the executive branch and, and how that, you know, what's good about that, what's bad about that? Allison, I think you get first dibs on that. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Joe, this would be a great one for you to start off with. Uh, well, I, I do think it's, it's an interesting um, historical circumstance that executive power is uh, dispersed among uh, the governor, our attorney general, commissioner of agriculture, treasurer, auditor of public accounts. Who am I missing? She's Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State, that's right. Uh, and I think that the Supreme Court has said in some cases in the early 1980s that their best understanding of why the Constitution would do that was to achieve a dispersal of power, to prevent all of the executive power from being held in the hands of one uh, executive officer. But in that same opinion, it's, it makes clear that these other constitutional offices only have such powers as are granted to them by the General Assembly. So uh, the case that I, I remember most clearly is one where I believe the, the governor tried by executive order to reorganize the Department of Agriculture such that the then, then Commissioner of Agriculture, Albin Barkley II, essentially wouldn't have a job to do. He'd still have an office, but no job. And the, the holding of that decision was the legislature could do that if it wanted to. It could take your powers away as Commissioner of Agriculture, but the governor can't do it by an executive order under these circumstances. So it's kind of an open question as to what it is that the framers were trying to accomplish by having these different offices. Uh, but I think it's, it's good to have interplay and occasionally conflict between them uh, to make sure that that executive power is wielded responsibly. Well, I'm not sure that the, that the legislature would agree with you, Joe. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it does, you know, obviously um, lead to a lot of internal conflict. It makes governing difficult. Um, and the legislature has taken steps um, to, to modify some of that. In fact, there was a bill, I believe it was a 2017, uh, session to strip most of the powers away from the current attorney general. So um, it, it, 
It's, Brett, that's a great question. You're, you see it play out in the press. It, it's, it causes a lot of conflict. Sometimes that conflict can be good as you know, we have our adversarial system of justice, but sometimes it, it makes it very difficult to govern the state. Matt, would you like to weigh in on that one? Sure, I think, I think this is an issue that is uh, very heavily debated in Kentucky now because of all of the lawsuits between my boss and the Attorney General. I think we've had six or seven uh, just this term alone. Um, this is really um, an unprecedented level of conflict uh, between constitutional officers over um, a lot. I mean, it literally spans Kentucky law. Um, that we've litigated with the Attorney General about. Um, I'll leave it at that, at that on that issue because I think that's one that's being seriously thought about um, in all corners of Kentucky right now. Um, the other piece of this, right, is that one of the things the governor has is that we, we appoint um, a lot of board appointees across Kentucky. So a lot of you in this room serve on uh, boards, um, and uh, the governor, you know, regardless of party, often comes under criticism for appointing uh, people who are politically aligned with him or, 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 that, or that sort of thing. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism levied uh, on that topic. And I, and I want to push back just a little bit on that and note that uh, it's actually good that a governor has an appoint, appointment power to all of these different um, various boards across the state because the governor is accountable to the people. Um, and if, you know, if, if we were appointing people who were not accountable to us and weren't running their own silos, um, that's, that's not a government that you want. You want a government that's accountable. If somebody on a board or a commission that regulates, um, say, the dentist is, is doing something, is treating people the way we wouldn't want them to be treated, we want them to be accountable to the governor because the governor is accountable to the people, if, but the board is not. Um, so I think that's really something, another part of this executive theory uh, in Kentucky that we're really starting to think through as a state. And the governor's not the only one that has an appointment power. Some of the other officers do as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to elaborate on a little bit more. Matt, uh, I think I'm going to ask you. So we've been talking about the different constitutional officers and how there's a separation, and Joe, you, you touched on that. There's a debate about a unitary executive. You know, our, our Constitution does not provide for a unitary executive. Um, and I know in this room, there's probably differences of opinion. Could you talk about the strengths or weaknesses of, of a unitary executive? Well, I think we, we do have states uh, that have a unitary executive um, where, for example, the attorney general is appointed or, and is responsive to the governor. Um, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't see um, a lot of really any of what we've seen with the governor and the attorney general uh, in litigation. Um, I think I'll go back and echo a little bit and develop a little bit what Joe said. Um, I think the, the Supreme Court has told us that on these sort of intra-constitutional officer fights that the legislature has the ultimate say. If the, if the legislature wants to put these fights to bed, um, the legislature has that authority and, is, and as Eric said, House Bill 281 from the 2017 session um, would have done that. Um, and so I think it is, uh, the ball is in the legislature's court on these sort of intra-constitutional uh, officer fights that we're seeing a lot of. Uh, gentlemen over here, would you like to comment at all about the strengths or weaknesses of a unitary executive? I think Matt covered it beautifully. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, I'm going to open it up. We've got a few minutes left. We're running tight on time. I'm going to open it back up to the floor. Oh, man, that's going to be hard. Can you yell? <laughs> I can. Eric, I think that's a great one for you. So uh, as I understand your question, so we're, we're, you're asking about that the Franklin Circuit Court has enjoined the Secretary of State from um, certifying any election results as, as to Marcy's law. Is that? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, as far as the constitutional interplay, it, it's, it, it really comes down in, in large part to the Constitution is what the Franklin Circuit Court says it is these days. Um, but, you know, it, it's the, the Secretary of State's duty to certify an election, um, and, you know, she doesn't have much discretion in that 
in that context. But you know, an injunction is an injunction, and, and uh, I think she could follow that if, if I don't, you know, if that's a, if that, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But um, I Right. That, that's that's exactly how I understand it. Uh, I'm just not, I'm just not understanding what, what your question is. jump in here you're, you're, you're welcome I think you're, you're right that it does create that conflict um, in my personal opinion the the rights of the accused I think ought to trump in that situation but if you're talking constitutionally a later adopted amendment I think it's going to be to be uh, more uh, uh, persuasive to a court um, you know they, ha they kind of have to do that because you know the voters have have decided knowing the, but you know the, the constitutional protections of the, the accused have decided this case. So, um, it, is that going to lead to more litigation? I, I think it will. I don't know if if, um, if the, the question makes it to the ballot. Um, but we could. Do we have another question from the floor? All right, I've got another question. Um, Matt, when, when, before we got started, you and I were talking a little bit, and you mentioned that you've seen just recently some unique claims that are state constitutionally based. Uh, if you could kind of tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. I, I, just expanding on what I said earlier, um, we're seeing a lot of special legislation challenges um, that uh, we, we've got two big ones right now that are pending uh, with the Supreme Court. One is uh, uh, the medical review panel statute. Um, and uh, that, we're, that we're getting a special legislation challenge. We've got one on right to work. Uh, the third one that I do want to mention is w one of the, the applications of this is that it limits the ability of the General Assembly to legislate with respect to specific areas of Kentucky. So it prohibits local or special legislation. So arguably, it's been where the Constitution has been interpreted um, to say that the General Assembly cannot pass a bill that applies only to Louisville or to Jefferson County. Um, th that is an issue um, that we're seeing a lot of. We've got an appeal before the Kentucky Supreme or Kentucky Court of Appeals now posing that issue. Under what circumstances can the General Assembly say, I'm going to legislate about Fayette County or Jefferson County? Um, those are types of claims that, you know, there's not a special legislation provision under the federal constitution. Uh, and we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, special legislation challenges um, uh, uh, in light of current laws that have been passed. Joe, uh, if you could pick one provision of the Kentucky Constitution to remove or sig significantly modify, what would it be? Uh, uh, great question. I think it would pertain to the way we choose our appellate judges. I know it's been a topic of a different panel today, so I won't get into it too deeply. I would also like to see a change in the way we elect our trial court judges, but I think that's a statutory fix and not a constitutional. Can I say something about that quickly, about changing? One of the, 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 the provisions in our Constitution that I think a lot of us, maybe a lot of lawyers would say is an, an anachronism, is in Section 228. Uh, do, do Kentucky lawyers remember when you swore the oath as a Kentucky lawyer, right? What did you have to swear to? You had to swear that you never fought a duel or that you'd never been a second for a duel. Um, that actually is written in the Constitution, and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, and actually, the Constitution has a provision that says that the governor, if you fought a duel or you seconded a duel, um, the governor can um, not pardon you until after 
five years of your conviction. So we've got very specific protections for that in the Constitution. And I think there's a lot of debate that says, hey, that's an anachronism that, you know, that's from yesteryear. Um, but I, I would push back just a little bit on that and, and think I, it's really, uh, I think it's really fulfilling for a lawyer to swear that they've never taken justice into their own hands that way, um, that we're going to turn to the courts for, for our grievance uh, on that. So while it is, a, you know, sort of a, an echo back to uh, a time now past, thankfully, uh, I think it's actually quite good for lawyers to be reminded of that when they're taking their solemn oath. I remember when I was in law school, my first year, uh, one of my law professors had just moved to Kentucky and her husband was admitted to the Kentucky bar and she told us how she heard him make that oath and she started to laugh. And she said she looked around and nobody was laughing, everybody was sort of staring at her and she realized this is very serious yeah. and this is not a funny thing. So I, I, I'm inclined to agree with you, Matt. Um, Eric, if you would answer this question too, if you could pick one provision of the Kentucky Constitution to remove or significantly modify, just off the top of your head, uh, what would it be? Well, I, I think as with you know, the dueling question, I don't know if there's one specific, but I think the, there is a lot of need for modernization across a lot of sections of the Constitution, particularly in the legislative um, sections of the Constitution. Um, you get absurd results, you know, like uh, take for example this, the three reading requirement. Um, it's, it, there's no reason in our modern technology with you know, computers we can have bills delivered to your screen immediately. You can read them you know, as, as soon as they're typed into the system. Um, there's no reason where we have to have three separate readings on three separate days so that everybody can get in their, you know, their horse-drawn buggy and make it to the Capitol to, to have their voice heard. We've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got all these things. And it leads to really absurd results like um, Mississippi has a, has a similar provision in their state constitution. So Mississippi has a recording playing of, of reading the bill and they have it set super fast so there's no way you can hear it and the volume's down low. It's just, it's an, it's an absurdity and we have some of that in, in, in Kentucky that I think we need to, to modernize. Matt, you've offered a defense of not changing uh, part of the constitution. Is there something that you would uh, change or? or um, I, I think we are um, at a really important uh, inflection point on uh, the Court of Justice and Judges. Um, and I think you're going to hear a lot about that. I think we, we really need to rethink that. There's been a lot of scholarship. One of the scholars is here that's written a lot about that. And so I think that is um, a, a serious conversation that needs to be ha happening in Kentucky. I, I would echo that. And I think you will see some, some action on that. Um, one is, is, you know, you're talking about constitutional interpretation the voters of only one county in Kentucky get to elect the judge who gets the first say on what the Constitution says and what it means and what it doesn't. And that's 119 counties that don't get hardly any say. And I think, uh, I think we'll see some, some action there. Very good. I've got two minutes on my clock. Is there some, one more question from the floor? All right, very good. I'm going to have like a, a very bullet question, see if we can answer very quickly. If you, oh, there is one more. Very good. Well, that's one that um, our state courts have, have more or less wholesale uh, adopted Chevron. Um, and uh, we do have, I guess, some hour deference cases as well. Um, so I, I think that's a, a, a um, I, I, they adopted in, I think, 2003, the Supreme Court did. I think that's going to be a serious question to be litigated, that if the federal government is no longer um, giving Chevron a deference, uh, we may not see that in Kentucky either. Um, and you, you actually have seen some state legislatures and executive branches that have refused Chevron deference. Arizona's done that. Um, I think there is uh, a lot of conversations happening in Federalist Society events uh, around the country whether um, states should continue, state courts should continue uh, to show Chevron deference. I think we'll see that if the federal Chevron deference falls. Joe, a lot of what you do is regulatory. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I think there's good reason to be skeptical of the idea that agencies ought to be deferred to in their interpretation of their regulations. One of the initiatives that came out of the, the legislature two or three years ago uh, mandates that every agency like ours at agriculture do a systematic walkthrough of the regulations they have on the books and make a determination of is this regulation still necessary, what amendments are needed to bring it up to modern expectations, uh, or can we just get rid of it? And that has sparked uh, a review in our department where we have come across regulations that have not been uh, touched in my lifetime, uh, that no one in the regulated industry knows exist, um, and I have no idea how they would be applied if there were to be some sort of administrative action. And so on the basis of that experience, I think there's good reason to say that deference to an agency may not be warranted in many cases. 
Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you.